Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hi there. Before we start, Brian would like to share a couple of things with you. First, did you know that Brian is a life coach, a grief guide, and a mental fitness trainer? Brian would love to help you with whatever life issues are challenging you. Brian has years of experience as well as training. You can contact Brian at www.grieftogrowth.com to learn more. Brian is the author of the best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted, Not Buried, which you can get on Amazon or Brian's website. This is a great book if you're in grief or to give to someone you know who is dealing with grief. Lastly, Brian creates free and paid resources for your growth. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash gifts, www.grief2growth.com to sign up for his newsletter. Choose a gift just for signing up and keep up with what Brian is offering. And now here's today's episode. Please enjoy. Hey, everybody, this is Brian Smith. Um, I'm here with my friend Kelvin Chin today. We're doing a little experiment, so it's, it might be a little rough. We're trying out a new platform. We're trying this with a live audience for the first time, so we'll see how that goes. But our subject today is we want to talk about meditation. And I was telling Kelvin, I've been working with him for a couple of weeks now on a meditation technique, and I recommend meditation to all my clients. I think meditation and mindfulness is extremely important. And almost universally, people say, I can't meditate. I don't know how to do it. It's too hard. You don't understand my mind. Kelvin's got a way of making this like really, really easy. Like it seems like almost too easy. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about meditation. We're going to talk about some myths about meditation. We'll talk about some things you might be able to do. We'll just kind of get into that. We'll see how it goes with the studio audience. Um, but I want to read Kelvin's bio. I assume everybody knows Kelvin, but not everybody does. Uh, Kelvin Chen is an author and he's an afterlife expert. His first book was called Overcoming the Fear of Death Through Each of the Four Main Belief system, Systems. It's a non-religious approach to overcoming the fear of death. I've read it. It's excellent. His new book is called Marcus Aurelius, Updated 21st Century Meditations on Living Life. That's a collection of 67 essays ranging from emotions, life principles, meditation, and the spiritual. Kelvin is the executive director and founder of the Turning Within Meditation and Overcoming the Fear of Death Foundations. He's an internationally recognized meditation teacher featured in Business Insider, Newsweek, Kaiser Health News. He's taught meditation at West Point and in the U.S. Army, including in the DMZ zone in Korea. Kelvin has been meditating for 50 years. He's taught meditation for 49 years. I think those numbers are a little bit old. I think it's been longer than that. To thousands of people in over 60 countries. Uh, and his past life's memories reach back 6,000 years. He's a graduate of Yartmouth, Yale, uh, Dartmouth, Yale, and Boston College Law. And Kelvin's lives in seven countries. And I'm really proud to have Kelvin Chen here with me today. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. It's always great to chat. Yeah, I, I've, I've learned so much from you, Kelvin, over the years that we've known each other about the afterlife. And as I was saying in the, in the introduction, uh, you and I have been talking about meditation and you've been working with me for a couple of weeks. You've been very patient with me as I've had to unlearn a lot of things about meditation that I thought I knew. Um, so start off by just telling people about your background, how you got into meditation. Sure. Uh, so I started meditating when I was 19 years old. I was very, very stressed out. So you could hear in the bio that Brian just uh, you know shared with everybody that I've had many spiritual experiences, but that's not why I got into meditation. I, I didn't even know what spirituality was. If you'd asked me then, I'd say, well, I went to Sunday school, you know, I went to church and, you know, and then kind of stopped going to church, you know, when I was in high school and stuff. That's what I thought spirituality was. I thought it was religion. Uh, I didn't know it was, there was something more than that that I now know. So when I learned to meditate, I only learned because I was so stressed out. I was highly anxious. I was at 
Dartmouth College, as Brian mentioned, I was beginning my sophomore year, and I literally thought I didn't think I was going to be able to make it through the year. Academically, I'm talking about because a psycho emotionally, I was such a stre- I was just so stressed out, um, and it, it affected my memory. I couldn't remember stuff. You know, hello, you're at uh, you know high pressure uh, you know university environment. You can remember stuff. And I, my memory seriously was, I remember sitting there in my dorm room. I remember this like it was yesterday. 212 Wheeler Hall, Dartmouth College, in the dorm, sitting there at the desk. We had one desk in the room. That my roommate and I, you know, we, uh, we sh- shared the dorm room. And we had one desk. It was a small room, big enough for one desk. And um, I was sitting at the desk, and I was reading a newspaper. I don't know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, something, whatever. And I remember reading the first paragraph of an article, and I got to the second paragraph, no idea what I had just read, what the subject of the article, I I completely like, you talk about blanked out mind, my mind was blanked out in a bad way. I could Mm -hmm. not remember what I had just read the paragraph seconds, millisecond before, and I thought, I am toast, I am toast. Well, how am I going to make it through? And so I was freaking out, and I almost went over to the uh, mental health clinic at Dartmouth just because, you know, I needed help. I didn't know where where else to go. I, I had no sensibility about, you know, getting help and so mm-hmm. forth with, with, with being in that really desperate state. In one word, I was desperate. I was walking across campus a few days later, and uh, some guy ran into me, you know, I I don't even remember who he was, but he saved my life in a certain respect. Uh, and uh, he he said, "Hey, there's going to be a, a you know some meditation teachers talking at uh, in uh, you know Chote uh, some dorm you know dormitory hall you know in Chote mm-hmm. 108 or you know it's going to be over in uh, you know this dorm uh, you know fi- you know South Fair uh, you know 210 or whatever on Wednesday at 8 p.m." Uh, it's free, you know, just go listen to me, maybe you might be interested. And I thought, huh. So I checked out that one. I wasn't into how he was talking about it. It was very cultural. The first the first two or three I went to were very, very cultural. What do I mean by that? Yeah. Well, back then, in the 19, it was 1970. So back then, those of you who are old enough, you remember, there, there was this kind of uh, informal circuit of Indian guru teachers or their students we're traveling around the university circuits around the United States, just, you know, seeing, yeah, hey, you interested in meditation? Here's what it is, and, you know, we can teach you. Well, you know, some of the first ones I went to was like, oh, you got to wear these beads, you got to, you you know, it's all this ritual, you got to, you know, you, you know, eventually you're going to have to shave your head, Cal. Now, Brian, you and I, you know, we're already there now, but <laughs> we're the, we weren't, yeah. back then, I'm guessing, Brian, I didn't know you when you were 20 years old, but when I was 19 years old, I had a, I, my hair was down to my shoulders. You know, my hair was part in the middle. You know, he's like, you know, he's a hippie, you know. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to shave my head, you know. I'm not going to shave my head next year or five years from now at that point, you know. But that was the kind of game plan that they kind of laid out in some of the mm-hmm. classes. I'm like, eh, it's not for me. And so then I stumbled into uh, 28 Silsby Hall at Dartmouth. It's still there. And uh, an auditorium. And there's this guy sitting up there on the stage. And he had a suit and a tie on. And he was like a regular looking guy. Uh, from the United States somewhere. He was an American-looking guy. And he was talking about meditation. And then he started talking about research about meditation. So my, my ears perked up. And I was like, what? Research? Because I was pre-med at the time, and I was very into science and so forth. And so he started talking about research on meditation that was just started being done in Boston by a Harvard Medical School professor. and a, He's a Boston cardiologist, mm-hmm. Herb Benson. And uh, Dr. Benson was starting to do this research, and so I paid attention, and he started talking about cortisol levels going down, research, study, it just started, and so forth. Little did I know, three, four, five months later, I was a test subject in in Benson's study that was the first medical study done on any form of meditation in the United States at the time, anyway, uh, 1970-71, published in Journal of American Medical Association, Scientific American Magazine, etc., yeah, that's how yeah, I got. I, yeah. So you were you were at pretty much the beginning for meditation coming to the West. Yeah, yeah, I was very. In fact, I was so much of it's interesting you say that because I was so 
early on in it, in a sense. I mean, some people, the Beatles had learned in 1967, people probably know that, and uh, they studied with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who is the who was the teacher of the guy I'm talking about, who was on stage, who was talking about the research. Maharishi had taught that guy how to meditate. I mm. later studied with Maharishi in 1971 and 1973 personally and, um, and learned how to teach TM. So I was with TM for about 10 years teaching with their organization. They went off in a different direction and I, and I left. But, um, but yeah, it was very early on, so early on that when I first learned, I'm guessing that at that point, out of the Cambridge TM Center, you know, where Harvard is, Cambridge, Massachusetts, that's where the one TM Center was in New England, in all of New England. Mm -hmm. um, there were maybe, you know, 50 T TM teachers there, maybe 50, something yeah. like that. Not that many. For, for a, a whole northeastern of the United States, within five years, I was later chairman of that center, in 1975, so five years later, I had about two, 250, maybe 300 TM teachers reporting to me out of that one center alone. And there were, you know, very, there were, there were literally probably a few hundred TM teachers, all of the United States when I first learned. Um, and within a few years, there were probably around 10,000, uh, yeah, 10,000 TM teachers in the United States. So, yeah, so a, it, it really blew up at that time. Really blew and, up, yeah. And and so for people that don't know, what is TM and how, how does that work? So when I first learned to meditate, I learned TM, and I give Maharishi Mahesh Yogi credit for being the guy who said, out of the millennia of, of meditation teachers in the world, whether they be in the Middle East or out of India or Southeast Asia or Japan, China, wherever, doesn't matter where, he was the first guy to say, it can and should be easy. Meditation should be easy, not involve focusing and controlling the mind. So I have taken that principle from him, and I have made it even easier since I left the, the organization. I don't teach TM anymore after those first 10 years in the 1970s. Um, but I give him still publicly, just like we are public here. Right. For being the spiritual revolutionary who said, no, it should be easy and it can be easy if you understand how the mind operates, which you and I are going to get into in our conversation today. But I've also removed all the cultural and, 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 and kind of ritual trappings from the teaching as well. So now I teach, as you know, I teach across all different cultures and religions and so forth. I've taught Buddhist monks, Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus. Uh, Christians, Jews, who am I leaving out? I don't mean to leave anybody else out, but you know, like pretty much the whole range of religious, uh, religion backgrounds and people who are atheists and agnostic and other words. I teach anybody. So I've made it much more broad, um, open, receptive the way I teach it since, since back in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my story in coming to meditation is similar to yours. I was just totally stressed out, anxious, you know, all that kind of stuff, depressed and needed something to calm my mind. So I, this was back before, you know, too much of the internet. So I started getting on and doing research and, you know, there, as you said, there's cultural and religious. I didn't care about their cultural things, but back then, you know, Christians didn't meditate. Meditation was in some religions is frowned upon, but I found something called contemplative prayer. So mm -hmm. I started reading about contemplative prayer. <laughs> Once I started reading about it, I'm like, this is meditation. It's it's a different different name for the same thing, but there's thousands of different meditation techniques. Exactly. Yeah. No, I I call my what I teach now turning within. Turning within meditation. Because essentially there are, as you say, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of forms of turning within. And mm -hmm. and people who pray, look, I give lecture sometimes in um, what we know, for those of the international people watching in the audience, uh, who people who, who in the United States we call the Bible Belt. You know, people are very, very much into the Bible, Christianity, but and very, very, uh, we'll call it uh, conservative and traditional, maybe as a word in terms of looking at the Bible in a literal way. And mm -hmm. so I'm not going to step, I don't step on anybody's toes religiously or belief-wise or whatever. And so when I speak with them, I talk about them with them about turning within, and I say, how many people 
I did actually had a lecture with in, in Southern Illinois, uh, with a with a group of about 125 healthcare workers who were, and and, and but their background they, they were was very from a religious uh, Christian religious fundamentalist kind of background, and I said how many people here go to church out of the 125 150 people? Of course, everybody raises their hand, mm-hmm. and and then how many of you have ever had a moment in church where you are praying? And you feel larger than you usually feel, I asked them. Mm. And a lot of them raised their hands. Not everybody. But I said, I'm not talking about asking for stuff from God. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. That's Mm -hmm. a form of prayer that many people engage in, and I get it. But I'm talking about if you're just like what you just described, Brian, you know, you're kind of letting go and you're just in a more Mm -hmm. open, receptive state in church and you're praying. In the, in, in the Christian situ- situation here in their belief system, they're praying to God, okay, mm-hmm. and or Jesus or whoever, but in the Christian tradition, they're praying, but they're in a more open state. And many of the people raised their hands, and I said, that's turning within. That's a form of turning within. And that is allowing your mind to connect with itself in this different way that I happen to call turning within. Because essentially, that's what it is in layperson's language. The, to demystify all the mystical stuff. That's essentially what it is, right? I, I think so, you know, and it's interesting, again, the difference between the Western culture and, and or the culture I was raised in and, and what you're talking about is we were not taught to turn with them. We were taught the guy was out there. Right. So that that is a, a shift. And again, there's a lot of fear about this. Um, when I was started with contemplative prayer, it was like you would, you would uh, contemplate a scripture. Um, but it was really like, almost like a mantra because you weren't supposed to really think about the scripture. You just repeat it over and over again. Mm. I learned later on rosary beads. You know, it's saying the same thing over and over again using, using beads. It's very a similar. very similar thing of, of trying to calm the mind and give the mind something to focus on. Yeah, it's almost now. Let's just talk about the last word you just said. Uh, yeah, last two words. Focus on. All right. So yeah, rosary beads. Uh, reading some scripture and so forth, and almost as you said, the key words that you just said were almost not even paying attention to the words of the scripture, mm-hmm. but you're just repeating. It. So, and the, similarly with the rosary beads, because you know once you've done, I've, I haven't done it, but I can imagine, you know, you've done it and uh, you know, repeated enough times. After a while, you're not thinking about what you're thinking about. Right. right? Exactly. So, so, so to me, that is not focusing on. That is actually not focusing on. That's an unfocused state. And that's, as you know from taking my meditation class, we talk a lot about that. The unfocused, the non-directing of the mind. And it may start with a little directing in that respect, whether it's rosary beads or scripture, da, da, da. I get it. But my experience, having worked with Buddhist monks, I've taught, I've taught every me- member of every clergy the technique that I teach, mm-hmm. which, as you know, is very not about not focusing and not content oriented. Uh, so it's not reading a scripture or a poem or anything. I mean, you could you could do non scriptural stuff. You could just read a Robert Bly poem or something. <laughs> yeah. and kind of contemplate that. It, it, you know, anything, but but it's not that. It's not content oriented. My technique, however, I have taught many of those Catholic priests, nuns, rabbis, imams, etc and Buddhist monks, who are involved in various other forms of, we'll call it turning within, whether they call it prayer, whether they call it meditation in the Buddhist monk situation. And yet what they find is the Catholic priests, the nuns, the ministers would all come back to me. I've just taught uh, several uh, ministers recently in New Jersey in the last several months, and they all come back and they say they get more out of their prayer after they do this non-content oriented, non-focusing technique that I teach, same thing the Buddhist monks would come back. I don't I don't disrespect them. I respect whatever their belief is and their practices. So mm-hmm. I didn't tell the Buddhist monks when I taught them to meditate to go, oh, you can't do your med No. You do your own thing, but you do the, what I'm teaching you first and it will help prepare you for whatever. And they would all come back and say, Wow, I get so much more out of our Buddhist meditation that they were doing at the monastery after they learned my technique. So I am a inclusionary, is that a word? Inclusionary person as opposed to an exclusionary 
you know, you know, how can we help people add to the, um, you know, the body of uh, experience and practices that they may already have? Right. Now, some people may decide, oh, I'm not going to continue doing that because it strains my mind. Okay, well, then that's not good. Okay, then stop doing anything that's straining the mind. Well, yeah. But, you know, you know, I'm not telling people they only have to do my thing. Da, 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 da. My way is the only way. That's not how I roll. Yeah, right? and I and I, I want to I want to get into your technique, but first I want to go through some some myths and some reasons why people <laughs> struggle with other techniques. And and you just touched yeah. on it, straining the mind, because and I've been meditating for if I, in case I didn't say it on here, I've been meditating for probably fifteen years, maybe more, uh, on and off, and then for the last five, six, seven years, pretty much on a daily basis, and. A lot of people tell me I can't meditate. They, they find it stressful. They say, I can't stop my thoughts. My, my mind is always racing. I can't focus right. on this thing I'm supposed to focus on. I can't sit still. I can't sit cross-legged. You know, my nose starts itching and I have to scratch my nose. So let's <laughs> talk about some of those things and why it's so yeah. hard. Yeah, well, let's first do with the, deal with the easy stuff first. The easy stuff first is that physical thing. My, my nose itches. My ankle itches. Scratch it. Look, I mean, the, the whole notion that you have to be sitting in a certain position, cross-legged a certain way, or God, I, there's no way. I can't sit cross-legged for very long. Never mind. I've never, ever been able to sit in a full lotus. It's just not physically, morphologically. That means structurally possible for my the body that I'm born in with, born, born into, that I live with, in his Kelvin Chin this lifetime. So forget about mm -hmm. it. So, you know, the, all of that stuff, I tell people you got to be comfortable. Where did all of that come from? I call that's what I call the trappings. The oh, you have to have a certain kind of sandalwood incense. Not just any incense. And not just any kind of sandalwood, not, any, not just any sandalwood incense, but a certain kind of sandalwood. Now, you don't have to have certain candles. You want to burn incense and burn candles and when you're meditating, that's fine. But that should not be a determining factor of your meditation. No, that's just a nice to have and whatever. You don't, whatever you want to do, it's fine. Comfort is the key in terms of position, all of that stuff. All this other stuff over the millennia have been added. So, you know, as you mentioned in my, uh, my, my your, your background of me in the intro, mm -hmm. you know, I have my past life memories go back 6,000 years. Well, at least three or four of my lifetimes, I was a Buddhist monk, okay? I was in Tibet, I was in Southeast Asia, and either uh, China and or uh, Japan, I'm not exactly sure about that one, so we, we, uh, we'll see what more opens up over the years. Mm -hmm. But the point is that I have had a lot of experience with what I'm referring to as the trappings of, of meditation, living in a monastery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the banging gong, the big you know, banging the bell, you know, hitting the bell and the gong at a certain moment, and so all of that. That's all unnecessary stuff. If people like it, it's okay. I'm not pouring water on their their their, their passion if they really love that. That's okay, but it's not necessary. That's the thing. So let's just forget about all that stuff. There is still I I, I mentioned this in a talk, and my daughter was sitting next to me once, uh, listening to the talk, and uh, you know, I taught my kids to meditate when they're four and five years old. They're 28 and 34 years old now. Um, and my daughter said, Daddy, you know, they still do that thing at the, at the, at the Buddhist monastery uh, to meditation students where they, they hit them with, bamboo, with a bamboo switch uh, <laughs> during the group meditations. I said, what? She said, because I used to tell this as, as like, a, I thought, like an ancient thing that I remember yeah, happening. Yeah. You know, like, you can't move, like you said. You can't move. You can't scratch. Not only you can't scratch your nose, but you can't move. You can't fidget at all. And in the, in the, in the, in the meditation teacher, the Zen Buddhist monk, is walking behind you. Hitting. She says, that they still, they still do that. I said, what? She told me this about six or eight years ago when she was at San Francisco State University. My daughter went to school there. And she said, oh, yeah, my girlfriend interned at the Zen Buddhist temple in downtown San Francisco, wherever it is, San Francisco. And um, she said, yeah, she had, a, she had to sign a disclaimer saying that she would allow them to hit her. So it's like the 21st century version is you got to sign the release form. Yeah. That it says that you, that now they're not hitting you and beating you. I don't want to create a bad impression in people's minds about Buddhist monks. Right. But they're just, it's just like a. Yeah. It's like, yeah. like a. Just get your attention. Like, yeah. are, you paying, are you paying attention? Yeah. Are you paying attention? Are you focusing? Are you focusing? Because they want you to focus and not move. Yeah. Like you said, 
So let's get rid of that. That is like, no, be comfortable, be comfortable, be comfortable. People have, have added these little trappings over the millennia, and now there's like so many trappings that you can't, you, you lose count, because I think it's because of the importance of being important. That one monk said, no, 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 you should be doing this. Okay, and then that becomes a rule in that monastery. Another monastery hears about it. Oh, you know, they can sit still for this long, and they can meditate for two hours. You know, we can only meditate for, uh, you know, by the time we're, we're sitting there for, for a half an hour, you know, we start, we start, we start getting so uh, impatient. We got to get up and leave. You know, well, they can do it for two hours. The next thing you know, you get this competition amongst the monasteries about how long people can meditate or how long you can sit still. I mean, that's simply just knowing human behavior, how these things have developed, because they're they're definitely not necessary. So then you talk about the technique. Mm -hmm. You talk about the focusing part. To me, um, it's somewhat understandable. Um, how that has developed because um, where do you start before you start meditating? You're in waking state. And so naturally what one would think first to do is to apply waking state rules to try to get you out of waking state. But that's a catch-22, isn't it? Yeah. That's like trying not to try is still trying, isn't it? So you cannot try not to try. You can't focus to be unfocused. It's illogical. It's irrational. It makes no sense. So instead of applying waking state rules, what I do, in, as you've experienced in my class personally now, mm -hmm. is I teach you guys to apply meditation rules. And there is a different set of rules to apply in meditation. I tell people... If you had, if an alien came from another planet, just like Earth, and they looked just like us, uh, except they came from a planet where they didn't sleep. Nobody had ever slept on that planet, and they, and they said, "What will you guys do at night?" You know, it's like we're awake all night. You know, but we, we bump into things a lot. You know, we fall down a lot. We, you know, people, you know, just you know, we we get into accidents a lot and that kind of thing. And you said, "Oh, you guys don't sleep. No wonder." So let me teach you to sleep. So what would you do? You would, you, you would have them lie in the bed, the thing called a bed, put your head in the thing called a pillow, now close your eyes. You wouldn't use waking state rules to teach them to go to sleep, right? What are waking state rules? Focus on rest. Focus on relaxation. Hmm. Don't you feel yourself starting to relax now? Relax your feet. Relax your knee, your, your legs. Relax your torso. Relax your hands. Da, da, da. It might make them feel a little bit relaxed. It's not nothing, okay? Mm -hmm. It might them make them feel a little bit relaxed somewhat, but will they fall asleep and let go and go into that state of sleep consciousness that we all experience every day? Yeah. No. I, I think, uh, and I've been working with you, as, as I said earlier, for about two weeks now, and that, I think, is such a profound analogy that I think that we can all relate to because – all of us have had trouble falling asleep at some point. And you know, if you start thinking about falling asleep and try to force yourself to sleep, that's the last thing that's going to do to put you in the sleep state. Uh, exactly. But I've never heard yeah. anybody apply that to meditation. And all the techniques I've tried to use over the years, whether it's listening to music, doing guided meditations, listening to nature sounds, whatever it happens to be, and, and trying to focus on that thing, it's still about focusing. Right. And, and, and I came up with that analogy, the, 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 you know, maybe fairly recently, within the last five to ten years out of my 50-year teaching meditation. Um, and, and it really brings it home to people because they, they, they may have had no meditation experience at all, unlike you. They may have had no experience, but everybody's experienced going to sleep. And everybody's had experience having difficulty at times mm -hmm. falling asleep at night. And everybody knows the harder you try to go to sleep, the longer you're going to stay awake. You're going to stay awake all night. And so it's not the solution. The solution is learning how to let go. And, of course, as you know, it's not just – that's not the technique. There's a specific technique that I teach. Mm -hmm. But that's the principle. And that general principle of the mind to turn – if when we, when we turn the mind within and allow it to go where it's going to go and then remind it <laughs> through – you know, the technique that I teach, right? right? Remind our mind in that way to be in that unfocused state. 
when it starts to start thinking all the thoughts that you're talking about where you know people refer to the monkey mind or whatever the you know the oh oh, oh I got to get to work oh I got to get pick up the kids up at school oh I got to get more diapers oh I got to go to there get all that part of our mind which is a very real important part of our mind otherwise how we get anything done in waking state without thinking that way we have to think that way mm-hmm. but that during meditation or falling asleep is not focusing on those that type of thinking is not the way right right and yeah. that and that's the thing i've i've learned from you just again just in the last couple of weeks after all that i've done because so many of these techniques involve focusing and, and I, I you've been very patient because i keep calling you and saying should i do this should i do this you're like no just let go uh, you know, and, 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 you know, it's not just me, the other students in the class, we're all, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's unlearning. It's unlearning these things that, that we've yeah, been taught. It's you, it's you, it's you and 90% of my students. <laughs> there's, there's about five to 10% of my students who kind of go, oh, wow. And they just, boom, it's like natural for them. Mm-hmm. I'd say 90%, 90, 95% of my students are like you. Because we are so, and it's understandable. It's not that you're you're a very smart person, Brian. It's not about you being dumb or smart or stupid. Okay, it's just like, it's not about that. It's about what we are used to, and we are used to being in waking state, applying waking state rules. Focus. Look through the car windshield. Put your foot on the accelerator and the brake pedal, like gently or har- or, or harder if you need to speed up fast. Mm-hmm. Accelerate. Okay. All of that is very, very important, but that's a very small part of our conscious capacity, that waking, that that directing part of our mind. It's very important, and it gets a bad rap a lot sometimes. You hear people say, oh, the monkey, like, I don't like the phrase monkey mind because it has a negative connotation to it. It's not, it's not a negative thing. It's very important for the mind to be focused and, and jump from here to there. Mm-hmm. If you're in battle... And I mean battle. It doesn't. I don't necessarily mean war. It could be war, but it might just be battle with getting your kids out the door and time to school. It's kind of like a battle sometimes. Right. With parents and, you know, out there, parents. You know what I mean? You know, it's like get them out the door in time to get to school or work. You know, these challenges are sometimes like battles, like the, that our mind goes through at times. And navigating that is important. It's not a negative thing. But learning how to navigate that with two key elements, number one, clarity of thinking and the ability to have that state of inner peace at the same time you're in that challenge of getting the kids out the door in the morning and getting them to school before the bell rings, that being in that state of inner peace at the same time you're in that quote unquote life battle, um, that that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. That's to me. That's the beginning of enjoying life. The beginning. Yeah, I, I I completely agree with that. And and you know the reason I think one of the reasons, there's a couple of reasons. As I said, I've been doing this for a while, and, I, and I've studied different techniques, and I've tried different things. Um, and there's also I think there's a thing in our society. Everything has to be hard work for it to be worthwhile. And so if you want to get the most benefit out yes. of something, and and I I found this when I'm trying to teach anything. Just, you know, I was just I've got some students going through a, a training right now called Positive Intelligence, and they're like. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? I missed this, you know. And, and so we want to do things right, and we've been told that you know there's only one way to do something. So it's hard for some of us to let go of doing it right. Yeah, that that doing it right is important in certain situations. Right. <laughs> Drive the car correctly. Go through the intersection properly. Do it right. Don't bump into people. When you're going 15 or 20 miles an hour through an intersection, or God forbid, faster, right. do that right. But when you're talking about allowing the mind to expand its conscious capacity, which is what we're doing in when we go to sleep, and it's what we do even more so in meditation, that's a letting go. That's not a focus and limiting the mind. We need to limit our mind and focus when we're driving through the busy intersection. In meditation, we want to expand our capacity because what's that going to do? That's going to allow the mind to um, expand and then trigger in a positive way the releasing of stress and anxiety and in, in improving the balance, both neurochemistry 
wise, neurochemically, as well as emotionally, psychically, and energetically in a more abstract level. Balancing. And so that's the Houston Astrodome analogy you've heard me use many times. I borrowed it from this University of Houston professor, Mm -hmm. psychology professor. He told one of my students uh, many, many decades ago, one of my meditation students was a student of this professor's. And so the professor told his psychology students, he said, you all think your mind is limited to like this little eight inch plastic bucket with about eight or 10 or 15, 20 ping pong balls bouncing in and out of it. And he said, the ping pong balls are like your thoughts and emotions. That's what you're experiencing. Okay. But you incorrectly think that your mind is like this little eight inch bucket. He said, no, no, no. It's like this huge Houston Astrodome, this huge Coliseum, this huge football, baseball, soccer stadium that holds 80, 90,000 people, but you're in there at night and you can't see all that because it's dark. And there's this little desk lamp down on the 50 yard line over this little bucket and you think that's your mind. And you have some few, you know, bunch of thoughts bouncing in and out. That is part of your mind, he said. But there's this whole bigger part of your mind. Now he may have been talking about it from a cellular standpoint, 86 to 100 billion brain cells, uh, on a physical level, or he may have been talking about it from a consciousness, more abstract level. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But either way, it works, this analogy. And I've been borrowing his analogy since 1970. Yeah. And um, when my student told me so, told me this, and I've expanded on it. So what I teach turns on the, helps my students turn the light switches on in the rest of this huge football stadium that is their mind. It's vast. You know, it sends a thousand feet this way, a thousand feet that way. They don't know that. They just they, they, they've been limited in this little eight-inch bucket. Now, back to your meditation question uh, point about other techniques. You're doing a guided meditation. I'm not an anti. First of all, I'm not an anti any kind of meditation right, right. person. You know, I'm inclusive. But especially with guided meditations, can you get some benefit from it? Even though there's some focusing and directing the mind. Other, otherwise. You're not paying attention, and it's not a guided meditation. There's got to be some level of focus and attention to the app or the person who's guiding you through. Mm -hmm. Okay. But can you get some expansion out of the bucket, in his analogy, the professor's analogy? Out of that 8-inch bucket a little bit? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And you feel, like, more relaxed afterwards. You feel like, whoa, I feel relaxed. It's not nothing. It's something. So can your mind feel some release and relief from that? Yeah, but from an analogy standpoint, I always say as compared to what? It's like as compared to a really just allowing your mind to really expand uh, to more of the fullness of itself. It's it's like the mind, you're, the, you know, these kinds of um, guided meditations and so forth will give you some level of benefit. So they're not nothing. Right. They are something. Right. But maybe maybe you're getting a foot or two feet or three feet or six feet out of the bucket, which is amazing if you've lived your whole life just in this eight inch bucket, right. in the analogy, okay? But what about 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 2,500 feet out of the bucket? You know, what's that do to the potential clarity and expansive experience of our consciousness? Yeah, I think that, uh, as I said, I've, I've learned so much from you just in the last couple of weeks, and it's such a different thing because you know, we, and we've kind of we've touched on already because we think about you know the waking state, as, as you said, the waking state where we're focused, and we we think about a sleep state. But I've never heard anybody talk about a meditative state in the sense that you do as a third state, right? So most of us we go into meditation and we're still focused, we're still trying to focus on something, our breath, yeah, um, you know, whatever it happens to be, we're focused on the way we're sitting. Um, so this is to me just totally different from what I've heard before. Yeah, and there are techniques out there, in addition to what you're describing, Brian, there are other meditation techniques are out there that do say, oh, you just use your breath temporarily, and da 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 mm-hmm. okay, you know. mm-hmm. So that's more in the direction of what I'm teaching, but it's still different, but it, because it, what, how is it different? So somebody may ask, well, how is it different? Well, it's different first, if you're using breath, you're using a physical, right? You're using a physical... It, it's breath is associated with breathing. It's associated with the f- physical body, right, obviously. Right. Okay. Um, what I use is a sound in, in, in the technique that I teach, as you know, and then sound is vibration. So it's a little bit more abstract. So breath is okay, but I've taught many people who've told me they've tried to do various uh, mindfulness as a technique. It, people, a lot of people don't know 
mindfulness, uh, which often uses breathing as a as a tool in their in their technique, is a form of Buddhist meditation that's been secularized and called mindfulness. So mindfulness is not the same. All meditation is not mindfulness. That's a mistake. To some people, I just want to clarify that because hmm. some people are walking around thinking they're calling any kind of meditation mindfulness. That's it's not. That's not accurate. So mindfulness is a specific form of Buddhist meditation that John Kabat-Zinn uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst secularized and called it mindfulness meditation. He's a Buddhist. Um, mindfulness meditation in 1970. Mm, so, okay. uh, but it's a, they've done a very good branding job uh, spreading it around in the media that, oh, all meditation is mindful. They just use it synonymously. It's not accurate. Uh, but anyway, but the use of the breath, I've had many people come to me and say they can't do mindfulness meditation because they, 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 they freak out. Anything that has to do with their breath actually triggers their anxiety. Mm. So I've had dozens, many, many dozens of students come to me with that issue. So using something other than something that's physically oriented, like the breath, is um, opens it up to a whole host of people who cannot. Because, And then the other thing is, if you think about it, you and, you and I have talked, we've had other podcasts where I, you, you know I help people with death and dying. Mm-hmm. And I've been, at the, I've been at the moment of people's death many times, in the room with them, at the moment they've died. Um, how do I say this? So it's fairly well known that the last sense that goes is hearing. Long after the breathing has stopped, so I'm going to say this to go out there on a limb a little bit to say this to people. Um, can you do a breathing technique right up to the moment that you physically, biologically die and let go? And even after that moment, because the physical body stays alive after you stop breathing. A lot of people don't realize that. A little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for a little while. Mm-hmm. You, yep. You do a technique that does not involve breathing, you can still be doing that technique. And I, true story, uh, just recently, I say recently, in my 50 years is recent, a year ago is recent for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I uh, taught a very, very close friend of my, a, very, a close friend of mine who we grew up since four, four years old, a very close friend of mine, he introduced me to him. He played in a band with him in the 1980s, very popular band called Pride and Joy. Uh, anybody in San Francisco has heard of them. Uh, you know, one of the most popular, um, um, you know, cover bands in, in, in San Francisco Bay Area, you know, hired by Aetna. And, you know, the San Francisco, they played the halftime in San, Fr- San Francisco 49ers uh, football game. I, I, I can't remember if they, you know, they played, they played at one of the playoff games that 49ers are in the eighties or nineties, etc. So m- my buddy was in the band with, and the band leader recently died. Uh, maybe it was a year ago now. Um, he had, uh, what's it called? Geoplastoma, you know, brain, brain, mm-hmm. brain tumors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I meditated with him almost every day for a year about, about every other day, I meditated with him just to help him through until he couldn't communicate with me anymore, of course, in the last, you know, two, th- three weeks, a month, maybe something like that. Right. But I told him what I'm telling everybody here now is this technique that I'm teaching you. His name is Coleman. Coleman, the, the technique I'm teaching you, you're going to be able to do right up to the moment you because he knew he was going to die. He just didn't know when, you know. Right right up to the moment you physically, biologically die, and after you will be able to continue doing this technique. And I'm telling you this, Coleman, because at some point down the road, you will not be able to communicate with me, your sister, Bobby, know your friends, none of your friends. You will lose your ability to communicate probably, Mm -hmm. even though you can still hear. And at some point, you're just going to be alone with yourself. So I'm teaching something. I'm getting a little emotional telling you this, Brian. Mm. I'm teaching you something that's going to make you comfortable with being alone with yourself at that most intimate moment of your life, right before you die, mm-hmm. biologically. Wow, that you know that is so important. That reminds me of something when I was talking to friends about meditation years ago, 
and, and another common thing I hear is people like, I can't be alone with myself. I, 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 I don't think I could stand sitting and being alone with myself for five minutes, let alone yeah. 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And I, exactly. yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the thing, the, the, so many people, I think what you just said kind of is very profound. It distills down to that worldwide, 8 billion people. Most people are not comfortable with themselves mm -hmm. in that way that you just described. They're not comfortable with themselves. Most people view themselves, and I would say incorrectly, inaccurately, they view themselves as their thoughts and emotions. Yes. We are not our thoughts and emotions. We are the experiencer of our thoughts and emotions. And, we, and, and, and you may understand that intellectually, that Kelvin Chin just said that, but experientially, trust me, I know when you're in the middle of the soup <laughs> of being like, overwhelmed by your thoughts and emotions, Kelvin Chin saying, I'm not my thoughts and emotions is not really helpful. It's true. It may be true. Right. But when you're in the middle of it, it's I, I've been there. When I was 19 years old, I was in the middle of it. That's why I got into meditation, mm -hmm. because I was my anxiety. It was like, I cannot get out of this state of being in anxiety, you know? And I, I help people get out of that state. That's what I do now. But I was there. I know what that's like. So that ident what, we, what I call that identification identification with oneself with one's thoughts and emotions is very normal natural when we are in that more or less overwhelmed state when many people are walking around in that fight or flight mode that's what that's when we get overwhelmed by that stuff yeah. because our, our fight or flight is being triggered too much you know i i um i want to invite the audience if anybody has any questions or any comments uh Ooh. feel free to jump in put them in the chat or or, or whatever you want to do to because we want to get you involved if you'd like to be involved so um but i do want to talk about that um that i the some of the benefits of meditation i think we just touched on a very very important one is knowing who we are because Yes. Most of us think we are our thoughts and emotions. We don't realize that our thoughts are not us, that our thoughts are coming from somewhere else because we've never experienced that separation. Exactly. Exactly. Where is this? I'm looking for a uh, I'm work, looking for something here. Oh, here it is. Good. So my, my buddy, Charlie Donahue, who's a philosophy professor now, he and I taught meditation together in the 1970s. He came up with this model, and it says conscious of blank. Mm. And he would, plug, he would plug in X, Y, Z. Mm. We're conscious of different things. So this is a model, he would say, of experience, of human experience. We're conscious of different things. and But the problem, as you say, is most people identify who they are with this side of the equation, the X, Y, Zs, their thoughts, emotions. Look. Some, uh, many people identify themselves with how much money they make or what, you know, what position they are in the hierarchy of the business organization or where their kids go to school or what kind of car they drive. Those are all X, Y, Z's. Charlie would call those objects of experience. Mm. They're identifiable. We can talk about them. We can point to them and or, and or we can feel them if they're emotions. Okay, they're identifiable. He said, well, what about this side of the equation? Everybody's forgotten about this side. This is the consciousness side, or what I refer to, you hear me use the word mind. It's the same thing. Consciousness, or our mind, our soul. This is what is experiencing this. We have to have both to complete the whole model of experience, he would say. Mm -hmm. But most people have completely forgotten about that, and they're only over there, like yeah. you say. Yeah. I am my thoughts and emotions. I am how much I am my BMW. I am how much you know uh, money I make and all that stuff. That's not no. Those are experiences that we are having. So what do I what what I teach does is it starts to connect these two. This is not bad. This is part of the whole model of experience. It's part of experience. But we don't. It's it, what's bad is identifying mm -hmm. with this because this is always changing and this is changing but more slowly this is we're the constant in a sense that who we are my conscious individual personality that's kelvin chin that is what's experiencing all this stuff and and when we start to experience it not just intellectualize it i mean we're intellectualizing about it right now because we're talking right. obviously but when you start to experience it through the technique in the way i teach it it more quickly 
expands that conscious capacity to that vastness of the Houston Astrodome, the football stadium, the baseball stadium, which is our mind. That's this. That's who we are. Right, right. right. We don't get just walked up into here. And that starts to create a sense of freedom because we don't feel so limited. And what does that do? causes relaxation, causes anxiety to dissipate, it causes cortisol to reduce and balance and adrenaline and lactic acid and all this stuff balances out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and so that, again, that kind of leads us to some of the other benefits of meditation. You just touched on some of them there because I know a lot of people are just like, I don't, I don't have the time for this. You know, they don't, because they don't see what's this going to do for me. So what, yeah. would, what, would, what, are, what are some of the benefits of meditation? So I would say this is spectrum, and uh, I have a lot of students who find me on the internet uh, for different reasons. And one category of students who finds me is says these. I don't know if it's four or five words. I didn't count them, but if they, I hear this often. You're my last hope, because they've tried every form of uh, therapy. Uh, they've been to psychiatrists, or maybe are still going to a psychiatrist, and you know, or, or pharmaceutically being treated with uh, psychotropic drugs. Um, they've tried every workshop, every other kind of meditation technique. They've tried this app, that app, and so forth. And they find me, and they read the stories from my students on my website, and they kind of go, oh, uh, you know, maybe I'll call this guy. It's a free call to me. Every, worldwide, I give people a free session about anything that I work, or any of the stuff I talk about mm -hmm. and work, 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 work on. They call, call me. So if there's no, there's, they're not losing out on anything, you know. They just call me up or, or set up an appointment, and then they um, th there's that category: high anxiety, panic attacks, some of them, um, and various levels of anxiety. And the other end of the spectrum is the spiritual folks, the spiritual group of folks who think, "Oh, I want to expand my capacity to experience. I want to get more in touch with who I am. I want to." Um, um, I, I want to connect with dead loved ones. Some, I have those people. Now, not everybody who's watching this may believe in an afterlife. You don't have to. But if you want to increase probabilities of connecting in that way, what better way to do it than to expand your capacity? Mm -hmm. You know? So you expand your capacity, your capability. Because, look, here's the thing. Most people are thinking, you got this little container of knowledge. We'll call it our mind, our consciousness. And most people are just putting more stuff in it. Oh, I did this workshop. I read another book. I did another, you know, audio book. I did another, you know, I, I went to this class. And then they're just adding more certifications to their, to their knowledge bucket, which is not bad. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying, but wouldn't it be better and more effective to do that and expand the bucket? So that's what I teach people to do is, is expand the bucket. Now, do I do some content-oriented stuff about, you know, what happens after we die and, so forth, and, and certain life principles, like you talked about in my second book, you know, uh, you know, you know, meditation, you know, twenty first century meditations on living right. life, you know, the Marcus Aurelius updated book. Yeah, I talk about those kinds of things. That's content, but mainly in terms of the meditation we're talking about is non content oriented. It's expanding the bucket, right. you know, expand the bucket. Don't just add more stuff to the bucket. And then, of course, we have people in between to answer your benefits question, people in between who just want more clarity of thinking, they're not really high anxiety and they're not really that spiritually oriented and so forth, but they want to be more productive. Or I have athletes who just want to get back on the playing field faster. They want to heal faster, accelerate their healing. Because as I, the, the research that I was in as a test subject and subsequently I was probably in about 15 or 20 different experiments at different times, they would notice accelerated healing, uh, strengthening of the immune system. So with this whole COVID thing that we're still kind of you know, in I think we're going to be in it forever, but we're not. We're coming out of the intense. You know, what is it mm -hmm. stage anyway? We now know what it is. Um, I was saying throughout the whole COVID thing, learn to meditate to improve and strengthen your immune system. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm not an anti-vax guy. You know, I got the vaccine too. But but it's like do to other yeah. things. Eat healthy. Right. Strengthen your immune system. Well, the meditation does that. Yeah, the the benefits are. Um tremendous and as you said they're physiological some of them they've been studied for the people that need the studies you've got the scientific study um right. so that's you know whether you see it as spiritual whether you see it as physiological whether you see it as just you know more calm or more peace um you know the benefits are, are, are there and you know it doesn't really take 
that much time. You know, it's just uh, yeah, ten to fifteen yeah, minutes each yeah. time. That's that's what I tell my students. So people, a lot of people go, "That's all," because they've been if those who have been to other meditation classes, it's like a half an hour. And then one of my friends, she finished a, a mindfulness uh, extended workshop. I can't remember. Went on for weeks for her. Uh, and, and I think she was, it was almost, uh, it was almost, a, I think it may have been a, even a teacher training uh, mindfulness thing that she took. And they, and they told her at the end, after the couple of months, uh, you know, you've been meditating for 20 minutes, you know, a few minutes, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, whatever it was. So you really want to get benefit from this? You got to do it for an hour or two every day, you know, hour or yeah. two, really? No. So 10 to 15 minutes twice a day, that's all you need to do. And uh, because the thing is, why? Why don't you have to do the way I teach it very long? The reason is because it flips on the switch, this automatic switch that exists in every human nervous system that every human being is born with very quickly. Why does it do that? Here's another thing we haven't talked about, Brian. Think about it this way. People know what the fight or flight switch is. They know what that is. That's the ancient switch that, you know, ancient. It's it's as long as we've been humans, you know, millions of years, we've had this fight or flight switch. It's a, hu it's a survi human survival switch. It's like, okay, heart races, blood pumps to the big muscles. You're either going to fight the saber-toothed tiger or run away from it. Okay, your mind focuses, your lacrimal glands, your salivary glands dry up. Everybody, everybody ever noticed that? Their mouth goes dry. Why? Because digestion is the last thing you need when you need to survive. And so that, that's the fight or flight switch in a mm -hmm. nutshell. Okay, there's a lot of other chemicals and stuff that goes on, but that's enough. All right, it's automatic. That's the point. Well, there's an equally automatic opposite switch in every human nervous system. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system switch. The parasympathetic. Automatic is the key word. How do you turn on an automatic switch? Does it logically make sense to control the mind to turn on an automatic switch? No, that's why it's automatic. <laughs> That's why the way I teach the technique that I've taught you, Brian, and all these other, you know, my students around the world, work so fast. That's why you don't have to do it for very long, 10, 15 minutes. That's all you need to do because it is easy and as automatic as possible. Eventually, Brian, you're not there yet because you just learned a couple weeks ago, but eventually down the road, and we don't know exactly when it'll happen for each of my students, everybody's mm -hmm. unique, but some months, or it might be some year or two down the road, it'll become so automatic that you will close your eyes and the technique is completely dropped away and it just... Yeah. You're being with yourself. Now, being with yourself is a term that many gurus have used for thousands of years. But what does that mean for most people? That means for most people, being with my thoughts and emotions and my monkey mind. No. That's not what we're saying here, okay? So there's a technique that gets you through that whole stage, we'll call it, that may last months or maybe even some mm -hmm. years, to a stage, we'll call it, or a eventuality where the technique drops away, right? Because it's so automatic, 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 It then you've trained your nervous system, your mind, your consciousness, to turn on the automatic switch automatically. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the journey that my student I put my students on. Yeah. Okay? Controlling is moving away from that. It's fighting the current in the river. I say don't fight the current in the river, go with the current in the river. That's that's what I found again just in the last it'll be we started 2 weeks ago tomorrow. Um, and I found in the last in the last couple of weeks I've been meditating twice a day since then and it, it gets the technique was already easier, but easy, but it gets easier. And, you know, I feel, um, and it's it also interesting because I want to talk about this thing also, like the experience in the meditation. And I, I was listening to a guy this morning was saying he learned meditation from some Zen master uh, when he was like 17 years old. He said he had this great experience. And then he chased that right. experience for 12 years. <laughs> he meditated every day for 12 years. Yeah. He said 99.9% .9 of the time I didn't have that experience again. And a exactly. lot of people like I'm doing this meditation, but it's not doing anything. I'm not I'm not yes. seeing lights. You know, I didn't have an out of body experience. Uh, maybe I fell asleep, so it didn't work. Yes. Yeah. First of all, let's deal with the sleep thing, and then we'll talk about the experience thing in a, in a sec. Falling asleep. Those of you who fall asleep in meditation understand that it's totally great. That's great. It's your body taking what it needs. 
And if the, your meditation teacher hasn't explained this to you in detail, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Then you know, contact me, and I'll I'll explain to you how valuable falling asleep in meditation is. All right. So let's talk about the experience, I you know, issue that you just raised. I've heard this so many for, for 50 years. I've been hearing this from people who've done other meditation techniques. And you know, in my meditation te- teaching, what do I do in my classes? I diminish. I I. I, I, I don't not talk about experience. We have to talk about meditation experience. But I, 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 I neutralize, it's a better word, I neutralize the value of the valuation. I neutralize the valuation, the assessment of our experiences during meditation. We need to neutralize them. If we don't neutralize them, I've coined a phrase, and maybe somebody else has used it, I don't know. But I've coined a phrase, and I call that spiritual materialism. That person you're talking about who learned to meditate from Zen Buddhist master when he was 17 years old, and he kept looking for that experience, he's what I call a spiritual materialist. Now, most people understand what a financial materialist is. Most people think of materialism in a financial, in a, oh, I got a bigger car, I got a newer car than you do, I make more money than you, I get a bigger house than you. Okay, that is materialistic. But I'm using it in a broader sense in from a spiritual statement and specifically in the spiritual s- sense because those people who are looking for experiences whether it be an nde a near-death experience oh my nde was better than yours it was more real i've had people say this i had a comment i just did a, 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 a interview the other day with somebody about uh, my experience in nde almost drowning and um and uh, it posted, and somebody said that mm. <laughs> in the yeah. comments that you didn't have a real NDE. You know, it's like it was like really, you know, it's this importance of being important idea. You know, you know, my experience uh, is is more important, is better than yours. No, everybody is unique. That's spiritual materialism. So we need to get away from valuing experiences as better or worse, whether it's our own experience or comparing to somebody else. No. Everybody's unique, and we are unique. This is the other key point that that person needs to be taught, who you're talking about, you told, you talked to many decades ago. That person needs to be taught that he, in fact, is unique within himself. And that means that his own experience is organic and fluid and changing all the time. And that to lock himself in by looking and expecting and trying to have that amazing experience that he had is locking him in and disallowing him to expand his capacity for experience. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, well, really well said. Really well said. So, um, coming up on, on an hour, so I wanted to keep this to about an hour. I'm going to invite anybody who's in the audience again. If you want to ask a question or anything, feel free to do that. But uh, I wanted to, Kevin. I want you to tell people about like how they can contact you. I know I'm taking the class from you now. I know you sure. teach this class on a regular basis. You've taught. Uh, do you even know how many thousand people you've taught? Uh, I, st- I taught a thousand people before the end of the 70s. Yeah. Uh, so that was a few years ago. And so I stopped counting thousands of people ago. I actually kept, I actually had names and where I taught them. I have this, I found this notebook this morning that I kept for the first thousand people I taught. And then I stopped doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, lots of people around the world, 60 countries. I teach on Zoom, like, uh, you know, a video conference. Uh, and or on the phone or WhatsApp. It depends on, you know, uh, where people are in the world and what platform is working best for them, depending, you know, uh, in my, 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 my students in Ethiopia and South Sudan and so forth have a, a lot of internet issues, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I you know, we'll work in whatever platform mm-hmm. that works, but mostly I'm, I'm working on Zoom worldwide. Um, and uh, the best place to re- people to reach me is just to type in my name, kelvinchin.org. Uh, and find that way. I have four websites. So if you go to the bottom of any page on any of my four websites, you'll see hot links to the other three, and you'll also see a link to my YouTube channel and so forth. You can subscri- subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, Facebook is also a good way to connect with me. And I, uh, my, my Facebook, uh, you plug in Kelvin.chin1 because there's more than Kelvin, one Kelvin Chin in the world now, and I wasn't quick enough to grab the <laughs> Kelvin Chin name. Uh, as my link on Facebook, they're, and and they're all like twenty thirty years old. They're they're, they're like uh, twenty thirty thirty five years old. 
And uh, I asked them one, one of them once. I said, "Oh, a baby book came out in uh, in China, and you know, anybody." So it was like a, a name book, baby yeah. name book. Uh, so that's a good way to get in touch with me. And in Instagram, Kelvin dot H dot Chin is my Instagram. So uh, probably the fastest way is either Facebook message me or, um, and I only use Facebook for my for my teaching work that I do. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a cool picture of my kids who I'm yeah. proud of, but. Um, or my website. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kelvin, I, again, thanks for thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, all that you've you've taught me. Uh, hopefully, this will reach a lot of other people and help them with some of these uh, misconceptions and things that we've had about meditation and help get more people to to embrace something that I think is really really helpful. So, uh, thanks for being yeah. here today. Great to be great to be here again, Brian. Thanks. Don't forget to like, hit that big red subscribe button, and click the notify bell. Thanks for being here.